we're very laid back here. Like I was saying, if you can't make it here, you won't make it anywhere. <laughs> so, for those of us that are left behind here, we're going to look at two verses in Romans 13. In Romans 13. And I'm going to kind of break into the chapter here in verses 11 and 12. And in Romans 13, 11, it says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. I put that rope up there, it was kind of, um, you are here getting our bearings, you know, personally, our own lives there. But uh, looking at this verse here, and by God's grace we'll look at some other verses here, you know, where are we prophetically, you know, where are we in God's timeline of history? Because he has not left us in darkness. We're not kind of bumbling around and kind of feeling our way about. When I was uh, a boy where I lived, we had a neighbor who had a, a young, uh, young boy who was blind. And I think his name may have been Eddie. I can't remember now. He was a little bit older than I. But I remember Eddie, he would just kind of go about groping his way, trying to feel his way about. And as he was doing that, he would kind of walk around the block and he would stay on the curb. And with one foot, he would go on the curb and he would just kind of walk. And by keeping the one foot on the curb, he could kind of, if I could use the word, keep his bearings. But for the most part, and he was blind, that was his name, and he was just trying to feel his way about. And in the world today, it's blind. It's trying to feel its way about, trying to advance into the future, not knowing what. But we are not in darkness because we have the light of the world. We have the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows him shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I'm quoting it right there. And we also have the light of God's word that we know what the future holds. And the great hope is that the Lord Jesus is our future. He's the future of ourselves and our, and our, our souls. And he's also the future of this world. So we are headed somewhere. And the apostle here is telling us that knowing, that he's saying that you who believe, knowing the time. He speaks of the high time and speaks also of not sleeping, right? So I just want to kind of look on that. I thought it would be appropriate this time of year to kind of look at that verse in that way. So in verse 11 it says, and that knowing the time, knowing the time. In our Bibles through the prophets and the Lord Jesus and the Mount of Olives there, what we call the Olivet Discourse, <coughs> and then in the epistles, and of course the book of Revelation, uh, we're told as we are approaching the end of the rope, as a people, as a race, so to speak, what things will be like that we're not in darkness. And I would, if I could just uh, mention three little examples about where we might be in this rope, this timeline of, of history. And no, we've mentioned in the past uh, Israel, the nation of Israel. And we're so used to Israel, we think that Israel has always been there. But for millennia, Israel was scattered in a way. There was a phrase uh, when the land was empty of the Jew, that the, the phrase was that it was a land without a people for a people without a land. The people were preserved 
the land was preserved. In the fullness of time, God fulfilled his word and he has brought back and is bringing back his people again. Wow. This is a, a big black tape marker on the rope, the prophetic rope, so to speak there. Uh, David, you had mentioned, you had read there in Chronicles about Cyrus. And in about 1948 or so, when there was the great discussion or debate whether the United States would recognize this new state of Israel. And it's a wonderful story how that came about. I remember when President Truman in the United States there, he made the decision that the United States would recognize the new nation of Israel. He said, I am Cyrus. I say this, I was thinking of that then and when you read that passage there. Now in 1948, when the Western world for the most part was biblically literate, they probably knew exactly what President Truman said when he said, I am Cyrus. My guess is today in the world, and sadly maybe in the room here, to say I am Cyrus, we really don't know what that means. That's another topic for another day, isn't it? But Israel is back in the land again. And when was the last time you used cash for anything? Maybe some people here do. It's so easy to tap. Number, please. Number, please. And we read in Revelation 13, 17, now that it had the clarity, there's still some things that I have to, to kind of gel before we can see clearly, but that there's going to be a day coming when if you do not have a number, you will not be able to buy or sell. Could you imagine, a hundred years ago, 1923, if you could have told the somebody in the church there that Israel will be back, the Jew will be back, Jerusalem, etc., and all that. Wow. Would you believe that in 2023 there will be a time when if you don't have a number, you won't be able to do this or you won't be able to do that. And how quickly we're advancing. If you don't have a number, there ain't going to be no Littles, ain't going to be no Ryanair, ain't going to be nothing if you don't have that number. Right now we're blessed that you just need it on a card or your phone. But we do have the light of God's Word. We, knew, we do know the trajectory. We do know where things are headed. And maybe we do not know the day or the hour, but we certainly know that we're getting nearer to the end of the rope. There's one other sign I was going to look at a little bit more specifically here. I saw, I think it was just this week, there was two news stories. And it, when, it, when I read it, it kind of hits me with distress. It kind of deflates me, and, but it, it shouldn't. And we're kind of reminded, I think it was Corey Ten Boom, if some of you have heard of her, hopefully you have. But if I can remember what she said right was, if you uh, look without, if you look out, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be uh, depressed. But if you look at Jesus, you will be at rest. So as we head in this direction, as we see these things happening, so easy to feel uh, distressed, depressed, but let us look at Jesus and we can be at rest no matter where we are on this rope here. But to get back to what I was um, getting at, the two stories was, I think one was on Sky News, on the website I was reading, that in the UK right now, 100, about 100 church buildings close every year in the UK. And the last sentence, a census, was for the first time that was under 50% of the population would claim to be Christian. Wow. That means over 50, not just 50%, but over 50% claim we do not know Christ. We are not Christians. We do not own him, if I can kind of word it like that. The remainder, I don't know how many are just what we call nominal, and how many do, again, possess him, know him, I don't know. But we see that it's, there is an apostasy and a rejection of the Lord and, and of the faith that's happening. And then I saw, it was, I think, RTE this week, 
that uh, between 2011 and 2021, there was an increase of 187% of the population claim no religion. So there's been an increase in one year, 187% of people writing down no religion. Now in uh, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And if I understand the original, it's where we get our word apostasy. That this day, the day of the Lord that's coming, it won't come until there's, I think some versions say rebellion. Uh, this says a, a falling away, and in the Greek, apostasy or apostasy. So this is just another mark. Yes, it gives me distress, and I can be depressed, but boy, I look at Jesus, and I can be at rest. The Lord told us that these things will be. And I look at this, and instead of being depressed, I can say, lift up my head, for my redemption draws nigh. If I can kind of quote from a, another verse there. We're not going to think, how can these things be? And I've shared this before. I'm thinking, my first thought is, I can't share it again. I'm going to bore the poor people. But you know what? It, it's worth hearing again. And it's, I think it'll, it can kind of give us an understanding of what's happening. Why are church buildings in England being turned into art studios, being turned into marketplaces, and churches being turned into pubs and a place for a drink and revelry and partying? Back in Deuteronomy, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, and in verse 10, on down a bit, it's uh, remarkable, I had done a little research, how many times in the book of Deuteronomy there's a warning to the people, to the nation of Israel, as they are about to enter the land, flowing with milk and honey and prosperity, and so much good things. There's the word, beware. Beware after you have eaten, and after you are full, and after you're in good houses, and, you're, and you've got prosperity. Beware, lest you forget the Lord your God. And just as a, a little example of that in, in Deuteronomy 8, and it's not the only place in Deuteronomy, but in Deuteronomy uh, 8.10, it says, When you have eaten and are full, then, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Beware that you forget not the Lord your God in not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes which I command you this day. Lest, when you have eaten and are full, and have built goodly houses and dwell therein. And when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And so there was just a, a little taste there. We see that again throughout um, different places in Deuteronomy. That there's, there's an infectious disease that happens when we're, when we're prospering, when we're full, when we don't see our, our need. You know, I've, I've said in the past, when people share their testimonies, you know what a testimony is, when they come and they share how they came to faith, in the Lord Jesus, that I don't think I have ever, ever, never, ever heard in all my long years on that road there a testimony that has said, you know, we had a boat, we had two cars, we had a holiday home, and I said to my wife, honey, you know, the Lord's been so good to us, I think we need to get right with God. I think we'll start going to church and we're going to start living for Jesus now. I have never heard a testimony like that. But you know what I have heard? Is I was broken. 
I was lost. I was addicted. I was in jail. No. I needed the Lord. And I'm sure you have the same experience either. Beware. Unless when you are eaten and you are full. And you've got internet and television. And you've got Xbox. And you've got all these things. Beware. Lest you forget the Lord your God who has given to you these things. Just have a couple other little examples here. If I could. One of the things I was um, reading about. It was a headline, and uh, this lady said that cooking, cooking is no longer a life skill. There was a time, a life skill, you had to get the ingredients, chop them up, know how long to put it, what you add to it, and all this and that. And it says that the article, the gist of it was, is that um, it's not even a life skill anymore, that, that now it's just a swipe of a finger, right? Now to think about this, it wasn't terribly long ago when the people here maybe longed after a one potato. Maybe the one potato was a little moldy, but they wouldn't care if they could have that one potato. I spoke in the past that um, I was at Marks and Spencer's a couple of Christmas Eves ago, a couple of years back, and what we would do was we would strategically go to Tesco or to Marks and Spencer's when we knew that the store was going to close at the hour, you know, on Christmas, Christmas Eve, because then all the yellow stickers, they wouldn't want to get moving those things. I remember being at Marks and Spencer's, and it was just a few years ago, we had these nice turkeys that hadn't sold yet. There was a bunch of us like vultures, you know, <laughs> just waiting for the sticker, right? And it was an elderly lady. We didn't know each other, but she was you know, kind of standing next to me waiting for a turkey for a yellow sticker, right? And I just turned to her and I said something like, did you ever think you'd see the day when a turkey would cost 80 euro? And she said, no, when I was younger, if we just had a couple of eggs you know, to beat up, we would be happy. Wow, beware after you have eaten and are, you are full that you forget the Lord your God. Many of you have kindly given Brenda and I some gifts, and I thank the person who gave us this little tub of fruit. Right? It was different. There was raspberries and blueberries and strawberries and grapes and all this and that that was in there. And so I looked at it. Now listen to this. This is the fruit that was in this little tub. I'm told the blueberries were from South Africa. The strawberries are from Egypt. The raspberries from Morocco. The red grapes were from Brazil. And the white grapes were from Peru. Around the world. Brought to us. You know, I was reminded in the Old Testament, Solomon, his wealth, his grandeur, and his glory, and how the ships came and just brought the, the wealth of the nations to him. I think it, wow. That. But beware, lest after you have eaten and you are full and you live in goodly houses and you've got comfort and ease, beware, lest you forget the Lord your God. And I believe that's the bottom foundation, myself, of my personal conviction, of why we see churches closing, people saying no religion, turning from the faith. Congregations becoming smaller and smaller and smaller because we have forgotten. But the verse that we've been looking at here tells us knowing the time. Okay, so we know these things. This is written to believers. You see it, you know it, you believe it. But we're told that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. High time. I think um, this might just be the King James or the New King James that uses that, that word um, high time. And what it means is it's overdue. Like sometimes I'm out by the, the, the door here greeting people coming out, look at my watch, 11.04 or whatever, go up. Oh, 
it's high time, I gotta get back here, I have to. Um, you students, the teens here, maybe you have your leaving cert, you're just putting it off and putting it off and your exam getting closer and closer. It's high time I start preparing and start studying. In other words, that the time is almost spent, the, the sun is almost going down, the opportunity to do the duty or do what must be done, it's almost, it's high time. We read here that we, knowing the time, it's high time. Time. It's overtime that we awake out of sleep. And where do these words find you today? Wow, we had that rope up. Some of us, it's high time. We're well past the linear here, so to speak. It's high time that we got right with God. Or it's high time that we do believe we. We have a wonderful testimony, but I should say that the Lord has a wonderful testimony, how he broke into our lives and brought us and drew us to him, and how we, the Lord Jesus has graciously saved us. But you know what? <clears throat> Over time, we get harder, we get, where our hearts get harder because our lives get softer, and we go to sleep. But it's high time. And speaking to all of us here this morning, isn't it high time? We were singing that song there about for this another year for thee. Have year after year, it's another year for me, another year for me, another year for me. Is this the year that you can rightfully sing another year for thee? A um, little exercise. <laughs> A little exercise, maybe. So you get a timer and put it next to your computer, or maybe next to the television. And every time you're just spending time surfing the net or watching mindless movies or entertainment, just hit the start button. And then when you get up to do something, hit the pause or whatever. And when you come back and you get glued to the computer, the television again, hit the start button. And then at the end of the day, see the minutes, the hours, the life that has just passed gaming, watching, surfing, or whatever it may be. It's high time to awake out of sleep and start living for the Lord. Or sadly, as I look at statistics, and we mentioned this in the men's study a little while ago as well, and I have to believe, statistically, but as much as I would believe that it is not true, how much pornography, it's, at, it's just at the, the click of a button or a swipe, just like ordering your food anymore, where all kinds of perversion can come before you, and day after day, and maybe even today, back home, your computer has a password for certain sites that you would be utterly ashamed if anyone here knew what that was about, what you were involved in, what you were spending time in. It's high time for the believer to awake out of sleep because our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. It says, and knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. It says to wake out of sleep. When I was, um, see when you get a new pastor, the next guy, my replacement, where he's going to be, he's going to have his own stories. You won't have to hear mine over and over again. But, but, there was a time when I was in the Navy and I was on that little radio station in the Pacific on Guam. And we were in the barracks there. There was four guys to a room in the barracks and uh, myself and the other, we were just, we just partied. We drank. We actually smoked the opium. We had the marijuana. We had the heroin. We had the LSD. We were just given over to these things. And every now and again, they would have what was called the, the captain's inspection. Now in the Navy, the captain was a veteran of a colonel. 
in the army. <laughs> and captain's inspection was the captain would come to each room with his entourage, right? His underlings or whatever with the clipboard and all this and that. And he would come into the room and he would inspect that everything had to be shiny. Everything had to be in order. Everything had to be clean. Well, we knew the captain was coming the next day. And I guess we thought, well, we'll clean up in an hour. Or we'll get straightened up in two hours. But I guess we got to drink. We had the beer can the cigarettes and the ashes, and maybe we're smoking the dope, I forget. But anyway, it was a wreck and a ruin. And well into the night, we were just getting high, doing all, those, all that carnality there. And then we fell asleep, and we slept. The cat! Well, this is, we knew he was down the hallway coming or whatever. Oh, okay, okay. Two of the guys bolted and ran. They were the smart ones. The guy Tim and myself, we started the captain cleaning, wiping, beer cans, this and that. And all of a sudden the door opened and there was the captain with his entourage. He came in, a shock on his face. You know, there we were. Whatever. Oh, the shame of it. You know what the shame of it was, I think? Not only that, we were not prepared. But before him and his coming, the impression was we did not care. We did not respect him. We did not fear him. And there was just shame and disrespect there. I remember he looked around, and I remember everything he said. But he said he was going to be back at 2 o'clock in this hovel, that's what he called it, this hovel better be clean, and he left. We got to work. The other two guys came back, and we cleaned and scrubbed and this. I guess we had the buffers out on the floor, shining it, ready at 2 o'clock, and he never came. But when the Lord returns, how is he going to find you? And how is he going to find me? It's funny that word sleep. Those of you that are familiar with your New Testament, um, the Lord speaks about his coming and so many times about being asleep. You remember the, the parable of the virgins, right? The, the two virgins, or the ten virgins. Yeah. How uh, some were foolish and some were wise. But they all slept when they heard, they were sleeping when they heard the bridegroom comes. And just looking at some other uh, verses here. In Mark 13, watch you therefore, for you know not when the master of the house comes at even, at midnight, or, or at midnight, or the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest suddenly he find you sleeping. Then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should take you as a thief. Therefore, let us not sleep as others, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep, in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. You know, the Lord Jesus mentions his coming, describes himself as a thief who comes. We've had our home broken into, and the shock that you weren't ready, that the thief took advantage and came and you weren't expecting it. The Lord Jesus speaks of his coming like a snare. Remember, people that would put a trap out to catch uh, some type of animal, this, that, or the other there. But the point is that it's a surprise. You're not expecting it. The Lord Jesus said that as it was in the days of Sodom, as it was in the days of Noah, so will be the day when the, the Son of Man, that they were going about their business. They were going to littles. They were surfing the internet. They were 
your imagination can fill it in. And like a snare, it came upon them. Like a thief, it broke into them. But our verse here tells us in Romans 13, 11, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. <coughs> when I was uh, mentioning that, that story there about the captain coming and all of that, you know, he left and then we had opportunity to get it right. We had opportunity to shine up and get ready for his coming back again, which he never did. But when we read our, our Bibles, that there is no going back. That when the Lord comes, it's over. We don't go back. We can't go back on the line, so to speak, and say, well, well, now I'll get ready. Now I'll put away my pornography. Now I'm not going to get drunk anymore. Now, it says, knowing the time, knowing the time, it is high time, it's over time that we awake out of sleep because now our salvation the Lord is nearer than when we first believed. And Father God, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray as we spoke earlier of possessing you, Lord, I pray that we would be found faithful, Lord. I pray, Father, that each of us would be found expectant, watching, waiting, looking for you and being ready, Lord. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would that you would turn us from our sin, our apathy, our indifference, or that you would rouse us up, Lord, that indeed we might be ready. We might be we might heed the warning. Lord, when we hear those words, beware lest you forget the Lord your God. May we not forget. May we ever be mindful. May we be found in you. And Father, through the Lord Jesus we ask. Amen. 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 Just close with a little thought here before I go. We all go and depart. I was thinking when um, I was engaged to Brenda. And we had that date. We knew that we were going to be married September 18, 1982. Wow, wow. But anyway, during that time, Brenda was getting herself ready. She actually made her own wedding gown, I guess with help from her mom, whatever, sewed it, made the hat, and then the whole, the whole spiel there. But she was getting ready. She was looking forward. She was expecting that day. And we're told that we are his people, that is, the bride of Christ. That we're to be expectant, to be looking forward to that day, to be getting ready. And as we looked at Romans 13, 11 there, wow, may we possess that word. May God give us grace to know our bearings, where we are, and to live accordingly. Amen. Amen. Amen.